Hi everyone, I'm Christine and I'm here with Inspiration Ministries talking with NASA astronaut and aerospace engineer, Dr. Jeanette Epps. Jeanette, welcome. Thank you for having me. We cannot wait to hear all about what you are doing. It is so special to talk with you today um, and to be able to include you and your accomplishments and a bit of your faith story as well in our celebration of inspirational men and women who are making history. For those of you who are watching and who may be introduced to Jeanette Epps for the first time today, she is a, an aerospace engineer and she is an astronaut and an aquanaut working for NASA right now. Um, your next mission, Jeanette, is going to be sending you to the International Space Station to live for six months. Is that right? That's correct. That is correct. I'm looking forward to that. Six months of research and taking care of, um, I guess, the Earth's largest laboratory, floating laboratory. Wow. And I would bet um, you're going to tell us a lot of things today that a lot of us aren't aware of. Uh, for example, even that term aquanaut, that's a new term for me, uh, but that's something that you also are. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means to be an aquanaut? Well, prior to flying to space, NASA allows us to do analog missions where you go to different environments and you practice what you would do in space. And one of those analog missions is where you live underwater. And in some cases you may live underwater for nine days like I did, or maybe even two weeks. So we lived underwater off the coast of Florida, underwater nine days, and we practiced what we would do if we went to an asteroid. How would we exploit the asteroid? How would we walk on the asteroid? And there were six of us total that lived in there. And on the International Space Station at one point in time, you had maximum six people. Right now you have seven people living above the Earth's surface, about 250 miles above the Earth's surface. So in order to practice how we would live, above the Earth's surface, we practice going under the surface about 50 feet under. And so when you do that, you become saturated with nitrogen and it's, a, it's an interesting environment. My goodness. I, and I imagine that training for those periods of time really does give you an excellent idea um, of what's coming up on your new mission. And the other piece of your mission is that uh, you're going to go down in history books for lots of things, but one of those is going to be that you will be the first Black woman to live on the International Space Station for this length of time. Well, there may be another one that flies before me, but we will all be there um, four months, six months, however long, and we're all there to do um, basically all the research that needs to be conducted on the space station in order to get us from low earth orbit and to the moon and then maybe maybe even beyond to Mars. Yeah, that would be incredible. I hope that we see you do that. I do too, <laughs> thank you. So that leads me to my next question, which is you're doing these incredible things. You are going through these really intense trainings, but do you ever have these moments that are what I like to call pinch me moments? where you think about your whole story and everything that's coming to you and it's just is it too good to be true oh i've had many of those over the years even you know being in graduate school and then going on to work at ford motor company and cia and especially being here at nasa and because i was a kid who dreamed about doing so many things and felt, you know, how would I get from point A to point B? Um, but one of those moments was definitely while I was training in Russia, in Star City, Russia, for um, Expedition 56-57. And you're training, everything's in Russian. Um, all of the systems, all the panels that you see, everything's written in Russian. And so you're you know, you're sitting there, you're like, how in the world, you know, from this little girl from Syracuse, New York, how do I end up here in Star City, Russia? It's just, it was just amazing. Yeah, your story has so many different roller coaster moments. And you've mentioned a few, but now that you're saying, you know, all of these things, is Russian the language of space? Russian is one of the languages because the International Space Station, one third of it is occupied by the Russian. 
Russian, um, our Russian co um, cosmonauts. And so the other portion, even though we are, we really do work very well together in space. One third was developed by the Russians and the other segment was developed by the US, Japan, uh, Europe and Canada. But we all work together as one while we're on board the International Space Station. So you, you alluded to it a little bit that you are from Syracuse, New York. But I'd love to know a little bit more about your story, including what were some of the other things you wanted to be before astronaut was on your radar? Well, it's interesting because um, neither of my parents were scientists or engineers, but I, my older brother put a seed in my brain when I was nine years old. And he said, well, you know, maybe one day you can become an aerospace engineer. And for some reason that never, um, that one seed, that planet grew and grew and it never left me. And that's what I always wanted to be when I, I grew up, an aerospace engineer. I didn't quite understand what it was, but you know, I said, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Did he just say that off the cuff or is that something he was interested in or was that just chance? Well, it was interesting because um, it was at the time that Sally Ride and several other women were selected for the astronaut corps. And so he had been hearing a lot about it. He was not an engineer, he's a finance person. And so he just looked at my grades and my sister's grades and he said, well, you guys can become aerospace engineers and maybe even an astronaut one day. So it was probably off the cuff, but he doesn't know that that one little seed, um, when you speak to children, you don't know what word that you're gonna say that's gonna stick with them and stay with them forever and yeah. encourage them. Yeah, and you have um, quite a large family, is that right? You are one of seven. Yes, um, in fact, I have a twin sister. We're, um, we're the last of seven, <laughs> we're the youngest. Wow. Yeah. Is everyone in your family very um, critical thinking strong or does everyone do something different? Everyone does something different. It's kind of interesting. Um, my parents were um, adamant about education and you know reading. So we all kind of read different things and liked different things and had different interests. But um, my sister and I, my twin sister and I, we were really interested in anything to do with science, engineering, um, just exploring. So we were just slightly different. So when you're growing up and you have someone that close to you with similar interests, is there a little bit of healthy competition that's, you know, putting into the drive? Yeah, there's definitely healthy competition, but you also don't want to be the one left behind. So um, you see, you know, me watching my twin sister, in fact, her name is Janet, <laughs> watching her do things. It's like, well, I want to do those too. You just want to kind of keep up with each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what were some of the other things that you dreamt of doing when you were smaller? <laughs> well, one of the things I loved were atlases and looking at maps and looking at even old maps and just traveling. So traveling was one of the things that I really wanted to do and explore and see different things and just experience new things. And so as I grew older and especially once I'm uh, graduated from University of Maryland, I was able to do a lot more traveling. So I've been to quite a few places <laughs> now in, in my career and on my own. Um, you know, one of the places, one of the places that I elected to go to and explore was Ethiopia and explore all the um, hand carved churches there. It was absolutely wow. beautiful. Yes. <laughs> My good. So what motivated that? Was that, you know, you had read it somewhere and again, just like you heard it from your brother, it just stuck with you and you had to see it? Well, Ethiopia was one of those places that you read about, especially in the Bible and um, even just in places that you want to explore. I mean, there's so many old things um, that are just, just mind blowing and just beautiful. And it's trying to figure out how people how did they build this church? How did they carve it out of stone? And, you know, there was an archeologist, I think he was an archeologist, Graham Nelson or something like that, who wrote about the Ark of the Covenant possibly being at the Church of Mary in Ethiopia. And so I think as a kid hearing that, I always wanted to go see all these churches in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. I think too, with that, um, I get this sense with you that you're just a great lover of learning. You have curiosity. 
So Jeanette, who inspires you? You know, we're the Inspiration Network. So we want to know, even though you've accomplished all these great things, who are the people along the way that you credit with giving you encouragement, um, speaking wisdom to you, uh, and telling you just go for it? Well, it's interesting because I credit a lot to my mom. Um, my mom was not a scientist or an engineer, and she had no idea what my sister and I wanted to do in life. She just encouraged us. And it's, it's funny because um, she would um, <laughs> encourage us to read the Bible to find inspiration too. And, you know, we looked at, um, you know, the stories about like Queen Esther and God's providence working there. And so, you know, she would encourage us through many different ways, but she never discouraged us. And that's the interesting thing in that, and, you know, being in this position now, I hear a lot of young ladies and boys, it's not just some um, girls, mm -hmm. but they're discouraged daily. And, you know, by people that they love, and I don't think that the people that they love are doing it on purpose, but they hear um, discouraging words and so they don't go for it. And every time I think about now how much my mother encouraged Jean and I to just keep moving forward, just keep doing what you're doing and how much she helped us along the way um, to get from point A to point B. She was one of our biggest, um, uh, well, and it's kind of interesting. She was one of our biggest fans and she thought we could do anything and everything. And we try to, and when that's, um, I think when you tell kids to dream big, you know, they may not make it to that, you know, wherever they're looking to go to, but they will achieve so much more if you encourage them to follow their dreams, dream big, than if you tell them, oh, you can't do that. Or, yeah, that's probably too big for you to think about doing. But it's those little words that you speak into a kid's life that causes them to either blossom or wilt. And so... Mm -hmm. I'm always impressed that my mom not knowing what we were doing or understood it and never saying, hey, because you're a female, you can't do that. Or you're a brown female, you, you definitely can't do that. Not once did she ever discourage us. So Janet and I, we always walked into every place as if we <laughs> belong there. <laughs> so um, I think parents are probably our, their kids' biggest um, encourager. They, they need to encourage their children the most they need to um, speak positive words over them all the time because on the outside, you won't always find that. But, you know, um, outside of my family, you know, they're watching people like Mae Jemison, Sally Ride, all of these people doing amazing things. And I always said, well, I, I think I want to do that too. I, I would want to do that too. I was very shy, but there were so many things that I really, really wanted to do as I got older. So you know, scuba diving and all these different things that I'm doing now, they're like lifelong dreams that as a kid, I, you know, I only wish that I could do. <laughs> Absolutely. There's, there's an element here too, when you speak about the encouragement um, and finding encouragement in the Bible as well. But when I look at your story, I see a lot of divine providence there. Um, you're doing incredibly difficult things. Uh, not everybody's built for it. Not everyone can do it. Uh, and, and here you are going, you know what? Just try it anyway, because you, you don't know you can't do it until exactly. you give it your best shot. <laughs> I totally agree. And even if you don't get to that point, you've done so much more than if you had not even tried to do it. So I encourage kids to go for it every time. Mm -hmm. And so for you, um, you've had a couple of roller coasters, even in your NASA career, you've had great moments of victory, but you've also had moments where a mission got delayed like this one, the pandemic has been quite difficult to plan around. You've even had missions that were canceled in the past. So when you're in those moments where you might kind of feel low or you might be thinking, oh my goodness, what is coming next? Yeah. Are there verses or are there characters in the Bible that really speak to you and encourage you? Oh, definitely. Um, my middle name is Joe. So I always think of Joseph. You know, he had some major setbacks. And, you know, so many years, 13 years, he was delayed. 
And so I always think of my, um, my situation in terms of, hey, at least I wasn't in prison like that, but I can take encouragement that it seems like everything is for a reason and a purpose. And so I, I really do believe that nothing happens by chance. I believe that everything has a reason and we don't know what the, what's happening down the road, what we're being kept from. We don't know what bigger plans God may have for us, but in the end, we'll see it clearly as we were sitting in that place where we're looking back and we'll have a pinch me moment. And we'll say, mm -hmm. wow, God really brought, brought me through all of that. And this is the reason why. And I've had that happen so many times. And my, my career has been, um, you know, people ask about, well, you had this major setback. I said, I've still had an extremely blessed career. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I can't complain when, you know, my parents didn't have a whole lot of money. There were seven kids in my family. My mother was a praying and a giving woman big time. And she felt that that was how she was gonna get her kids through everything that we wanted. And she was right. I mean, we, my twin sister and I, we ended up with scholarships for undergrad and then scholarships for graduate school. Then, you know, we were able to get um, jobs that we were very interested in. And, you know, my twin sister, she wanted to become a professor, but she decided that she wanted to try out the patent and trademark office. And that was in 1998. She's still there. Wow. <laughs> and, yeah, she loves it there. And it's offered her so many different um, avenues of things that she really wanted in life. And my career, I mean, what can I say? I've been, you know, I wanted to travel all over the world when I was a kid. I've done that in my careers. I wanted to be a great scientist and try to contribute something. And, you know, I've been able to do that in a lot of the different positions I've had. And now being able to um, go to space and, from that perch, look back at the earth and say, wow, um, you know, there's so many things you don't know, but I, I do think that everyone has that pinch me moment, probably people who go to space, that pinch me moment, when you look at the earth from there, and you like, got to think, wow, there's got to be a God, because that's just, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. So my career and my whole life, um, when I think about the story of Joseph, and I think about how varied and it was and how successful he was and no matter what position he was in. You know, that's one of the things my mom wanted my sister and I to do. No matter what job you're doing, do it with excellence. And then, you know, know that that's not where you're gonna stay, but keep mo moving forward. Hmm. And that's what Joseph did. And, you know, he kept being excellent at everything he did, but he also, at the end, you know, when he interpreted the, the dream, he gave God the glory. And that is where I think at the end, when we see all of these things, you got to say, wow, you got to give God the glory at mm -hmm. the end. And so he's just one of many stories in the Bible that truly inspire me. Um, of course, I mentioned the story of um, Esther. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was a young girl who didn't know she lost her parents early. And, you know, she ends up becoming the queen. And so, um, and then she, she helped save all of her people at the end of the day. So she may have thought her purpose was to become queen, but at the end, it was really to save lives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so many um, stories in the Bible that, um, you know, when I think about it, um, I, I'm, I'm speechless almost because there's a lot of things in my life that could parallel a lot of things that um, I've read in the Bible and, Oh, it have inspired me over the decades of being in this career and um, going through graduate school. Just I can reach back in each um, each phase of my life. There's a story that inspired me. If it wasn't David, it was Joseph. It was Ruth. Oh my gosh, completely inspirational stories too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a kid, my mom encouraged Janet and me to read the Bible and. Like, it's funny because I was talking to my sister yesterday and, and I said, you know, we read the King James Version so much. I can't say Psalms 23 without quoting the King James Version. <laughs> and so, um, you know, she really kind of ingrained in us reading and but re reading the Bible in particular and falling back on the stories and becoming inspired through those stories. 
That's amazing. And I love this concept that you've just vocalized so beautifully. You think you know what you're here for. And in the end, I think we're all going to be surprised. I agree. I definitely <laughs> believe that. So nothing happens by chance. Everything happens for a purpose and a reason. I really do believe that. And that's what sustained me through all of these ups and downs. So that is amazing. So um, I want to ask you, uh, in the couple remaining minutes that we have, um, tell me a little bit about the goal of your trip to the space station. What will you be doing and what are you trying to learn? Well, so as an astronaut, everyone goes to the International Space Station, which is the world's largest floating laboratory. And we do research. If um, we're not doing research on stem cells, different things, um, materials, we in and of ourselves are experiments as well. So everything that we do, all the research that we do on the International Space Station will take us from low earth orbit to orbiting the moon at some someday and staying at the moon and having a permanent presence there. And then even beyond that, everything that we learn as we go outside of the earth's protection as we're doing experiments at the moon, we're gonna take all of that and hopefully one day get to Mars as well. So that's the plan and the purpose. But for me, as a curious kid, everything that we do is gonna be a new experience. Um, just, uh, I feel like I'll be a kid in a, in a candy store, eyes wide and everything you see and touch and floating there, it's gonna be new. Even something that seems mundane and ordinary here on earth, it's gonna to be totally different in space, like water, for example. Without gravity, you only have surface tension, so you get these water balls floating around. So um, for me, my goal is, um, as a curious kid, to continue to explore and explore everything that I can in those six months, um, maybe talk to you, maybe talk to different people and share with them what I'm seeing and how I feel at the time, because you know we're privileged to get to go to the International Space Station and so I feel like it's, we're incumbent to like, hey, this is where your taxpayers' are, um, dollars are going, and this is what happened, and this is what we're seeing, and share with you everything that we're doing. Mm -hmm. This is an, an incredible idea because you have worked for NASA for many administrations, and yes. each of those administrations has a different goal, right? They're all trying to achieve something different. So what are some of the other variations of things you've been tasked with in the past? Well, it's interesting because at one point they retired the shuttle and we were flying only with the Russians. So I did all of the training in Russia to fly on a Soyuz. And it was, that was one of the most amazing things I've done. So flying on the Soyuz and working with our um, Russian colleagues was a big that was one of our main goals. And now that we transition and we have SpaceX and hopefully Boeing soon, we have these commercial vehicles. Um, hopefully we can use those vehicles to continue to work on the International Space Station and get it to a point where it becomes almost completely commercial, where we're, the taxpayer dollars aren't going to sustain it anymore. And then beyond that, next thing is prepare to stay at the moon. And so there's a lot of um, different research topics, you know, materials, how do we, um, you know, exploit the surface of the moon for resources that we can use so that we don't have to upmass everything from the earth. Mm -hmm. And so how do we start utilizing the moon um, to the fullest extent that we can without, you know, endangering the environment, you know, and do it in a, in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. So there's yes. a lot of different phases here. Yeah, and uh, it was pretty exciting to hear. Um, has it already been a year? Under the previous administration, this goal of um, being on the moon in 2024. Yes. Are uh, you so... on track? Will you be <laughs> in that mission too? Oh, well, I have to wait to see, you know, after what I get one mission under my belt, then I can start thinking and hoping for that. But um, I think everyone has eyes towards the moon. And even if we don't get there, how do we su support everything that needs to happen there? How do we help them stay on the moon? You know, I think um, one of the things in talking with uh, Dina Freeman out at NASDAQ, um, she predicted that there would be a trillion dollars worth of businesses and research that pops up because we're going back to the moon and staying on the moon. So, you know, there's a lot of um, 
in doing that, we have to do it in a, a, um, a very respectful way where we're not exploiting things to the point where we're going to destroy it. You know, I know a lot of people are really concerned about the environment here on Earth and recycling and the global warming and different things. We want to make sure that we do not leave a negative footprint on the moon. So all of the things that we're doing is, um, uh, I think, over the next um, probably in the next three years, seeing someone set foot on the moon will help inspire even more people to get involved. And I think that's where she was, you know, this trillion dollars worth of uh, revenue that could come from. I think once we have someone land on the moon, they'll see it's possible. People will wanna participate and contribute whatever way that they can. It, it'll be a very exciting time. So that being said, obviously you work with a lot of people internationally, you train internationally, and you know, we know a lot of people want to go to the moon. So is there a space race still, or is it a lot more collaborative now? Well, see, that's the beauty now. Um, it's definitely a lot more collaborative. You know, I went to Columbia and talking with the students there, they're really interested in, you know, if the United States goes back to the moon, how can we participate? How can we contribute? You know, is there science that we can do to help get there? And, you know, Russia's all on, you know, there's different things that, of how we can participate and collaborate with them as well. Our European Space Agency colleagues definitely involve Canada, Japan, all over the world. Everyone's really interested in how we, they can be a part of the Artemis um, program. And so there's a whole, um, in fact, online on NASA.gov, you can see all the people who want to participate in Arte, the Artemis program going back to the moon. So there's going to be a lot of international collaboration and, you know, people, um, I think, from places where they don't have a space program will be able to participate in different ways. And you, ne you never know who's going to end up living and staying on the moon. Mm. Well, Jeanette, it has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today and learn about you, your story, and all of the things that you have to share uh, that are so exciting. We are rooting for you. We are praying for you. Um, and maybe we'll talk to you when you get to space. I look forward to that. Thank you for having me, Christine. It's been an absolute pleasure.